Okay, we're going to begin. I think this is the third session in the history strand. Uh, for those of you who have seen it uh, throughout. And we've gone from the middle of the 19th century to the beginning uh, of the 20th and um, some way towards the end of the 20th century by the time we finish this morning. There's many things I could say uh, uh, about Penny in terms of her ability and expertise to deal with this question of the, um, the socialization of architecture and social relations and uh, technological impact of the 20th century. But I think I'll confine myself uh, to one thing, which is to remind everyone that uh, uh, we're going to be very pleasantly surprised because Penny had to step in to do this at almost the last minute um, when um, uh, Bruno Wolfenfeld uh, was uh, tied to a chair in Brussels. Uh, fake worse than death, I'm imagining, if you've ever spent any time in that city. Uh, uh, so Penny uh, has been elevated from chair to speaker. Um, I've been promoted from the Southern Conference League to be the chair. <laughs> but I'm going to be slightly different because it's, um, it's technological here today. We're in the 20th century, we've reached futurism. We're going to have lots of pictures, so I am not going to sit there, otherwise I would not be able to see any of them. So I'm going to be the chair here before coming back over that. That's enough for me. Penny? Okay. Um, <coughs> they just wait outside, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> um, this, this has been a quite interesting experience for me because I do teach a little bit of futurism um, in my professional life as a teacher uh, to architecture students, but it is a very little bit. And um, I had an interesting discussion with Bruno last week, I think, being um, in the kitchen, I was really looking forward to this session. And I'd, um, already told Angus that Marinette was one of my favourite people um, and uh, had sort of flagged up the fact that I was very enthusiastic about the features. And then talking to Bruno, um, he had really nothing very good to say about them at all. Um, so that put me in a really difficult position for a week whereby I've been struggling with myself in an attempt to try to find a, a position, um, not in the middle, but somewhere which captures both the uh, possibilities and, and, and sense of uh, human possibility that exists uh, as a kernel within this movement, as an impulse, within this moment in time rather than this particular movement, I think, um, and, uh, and to also recognise the problematic elements of it. And I'm going to stress the problematic elements because I suspect that quite a lot of people in the room share my sort of slightly superficial enthusiasm. <laughs> of course, we share an enthusiasm for the moment because in the middle of it, there's one of the most exciting things that happened in the 20th century, um, the Revolution. But we also sort of share an enthusiasm for lots of the things that happen uh, around that moment. And, and, and so I'm, I'm going to bend the stick on, on the critical side, uh, and you can hear me. Uh, Speaking through the United the Occupations. This, I mean, this moment in history and the telling of the story of this moment in history absolutely abounds with fallacies. So I am very conscious of the fact that when I teach 17-year-old um, Scots uh, about the history of modernism, I know that I will touch nerve with them and I will engage their enthusiasm when I show them this picture. This is a Japanese student at the Fair House who witnessed the expulsion um, of um, Fair House um, from Dessau by the Nazis in 1932. 1932 is quite late, they really think about it. They've managed to sort of um, find a place for themselves for a period of time when other people have already um, disappeared. It's important because if you bear in mind what Frank was saying yesterday um, about historiography, um, it captures uh, very much the sort of um, question, the problematic of, of, of this time, which is that most of the way in which the history of architecture and cultural production in this period has been handed down to us has been handed down in a particular sort of moralistic framework. In other words, modernism and the language which you associate with the Bauhaus, which I'm assuming that people know what I mean by that, is from 
utilitarian, clean, simplistic kind of aesthetic, uh, is associated with the progressive forces in society. And because of the experience, uh, particularly in Germany, um, of fascism, then uh, reactionary right-wing ideas, this is a very black and white sort of uh, interpretation, but, uh, but sometimes it's not that subtle, are associated with the aesthetic return to the past. <coughs> either country cottages and kitsch, or classes. So basically the framework through which historiography, the telling of the story of the history of modernism operates, is one in which uh, most scholars come from a liberal left tradition and prefer to tell a tale uh, in which we can associate artistic and aesthetic expression clearly with a political idea. That in and of itself is problematic, um, but that's the framework. And I have to admit that uh, I would be quite self-critical and recognize that it's very easy to fall into that uh, slightly simplistic and moralistic trap. And so what I'm going to try to do, just before I go through uh, the Futures Manifestos, uh, is just explain how it's not possible really to um, look at the history in that way, but how it's important to understand how the history uh, of modernism and modern cultural production um, has been told in the past. So, um, if you look at um, the whole of the 20th century, it's quite, it's quite interesting the way <coughs> architectural history has been told. And I'm just going to focus on architecture. I'm sure there are other people in this room that know more about other subjects that can perhaps fit into this theme. In the immediate afterward month of the period that I'm looking at today, which is really 1909 to the mid-1920s, the people that write the history of that period are predominantly people who participate. So if you remember the fact we talked about yesterday, um, you know, they're, 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 it's the immediate history. And those individuals, Nicholas Pevsner, an immigrant from Russia, C.P. Gideon, a Swiss um, um, intellectual who um, sort of circulates around Europe, they tell that history predominantly in the form of a discussion of uh, mechanization and innovation. There's a little bit of the great men in there, um, but they have a kind of teleological view of history which is predicated on the idea that you have progress through this period, and progress is quite often led by and given expression to um, by great architects who through their um, genius and their innovation suddenly give some some kind of aesthetic form to the ideas that exist at the time. And those individuals write that history completely separate from any discussion of what's happening politically. If you read those books, you wouldn't know what the historical context was at all, because they're not particularly interested in it, except in terms of the development of material production and mechanization, where they're constantly telling you about um, how certain changes in technology give rise to certain innovations in architectural expression. So the best example of that would be Siegfried Gideon has written a book called Mechanization Takes Command, which is a very interesting book, and it's a study of the ordinary, uh, everyday revolutions that take place uh, in domestic and commercial life in terms of, but if you look at something like the bath, and you'll say, well, I mean, if you look at through the whole of human history, the way in which we have used technology to transform the way that we wash and take a bath and the way it has impacted on every aspect of our lives is fascinating, and you can trace that as a sort of Okay, so those are the people from the 30s, and they're the people that I read, James read, and other people read. So they're the people that give us a particularly sort of mechanistic, production-based uh, view, slightly detached. In the 1960s, people started to say, oh, but that understanding is so autonomous, it operates so separately uh, from the real movement of history, the real changes in society. It assumes that art and cultural production are um, a world of their own, and therefore we need more critical engagement with what is really being transformed, not just through technology, but the level of material conditions. And uh, Manfredo Tafuri, and I think the Italians are particularly productive in this area, which would be an interesting question why uh, Italian intellectuals who always have such a slightly detached and angry quality to them from my experience, why they, <laughs> why they uh, you forget the slide. <laughs> useful. Um, but Manfredo Tafuri, he says 
actually, I'm going to go back and look at this period where you say these great men transformed our understanding of the world through, like, Corbusier through architecture and, uh, and aesthetics. And I'm going to look a bit more critically. And Tafori says, actually, we can understand futurism and all of the avant-garde, all of those movements that were apparently transgressing the old rules of cultural production <coughs> in that period around the 1920s, all of them really uh, are the outcome of the experience of the Enlightenment. It's not a bad, bad point to make. So he says, we locate the beginnings of the modernist movement, modernist aesthetic movement, and modernism and modernization in the 1750s. And we can trace that as a process. So their preoccupation is historical continuity. <coughs> the guys writing in the 30s who have been through this experience, their preoccupation is that this is a big break and people make major leaps in imagination. So the two different kinds of history. And then, uh, unfortunately, in the 1980s, <coughs> you get the development of historiography. People like me who spend all their time talking about who said what about what rather than actually <laughs> saying what the thing it is itself. So that, the real dominant trend of Griffin criticizing it in his book. Um, you get the development of historiography where everybody just takes apart what happened in terms of the work of modernism and they sort of say, well, yeah, nothing really happened because everybody was just expressing their own drives and impulses and, and uh, instincts. And Griffin tries to sort of overcome that problem by sort of saying that there are these sort of dominant drives. <laughs> Predominant in that is a sort of reinterpretation of what happens in that period around 1909 to mid-20s as a sort of issue of uh, anxiety and alienation and estrangement. So if you think of that framework in the 30s, technology, innovation, driving things, in the 60s, uh, really it's more a part of historical continuity and connected to society, and in the 80s, uh, it's a problem of anxiety. If you think about that, somehow that kind of uh, narrative about the telling of the history, I think is quite useful because it allows you to um, get your head around the problem that always exists here, which is how do you think about artistic production in relation to politics? And it's, it's really a very difficult thing to do, I think. Uh, you think about artistic production um, as a product, of forces that are operating outside of that sphere, you know, as, a, as an expression of the conditions in which it finds itself. You think about it as something that gives form to certain ideas that exist in society. So there's a progressive, radical, transformative impulse in 1909. Uh, the futurists give form to it. They give an aesthetic and visual form which allows people to understand it. And you can think about artistic production as autonomous in that the artist does operate to a certain extent and aspires to operate separate from the trends in society. And I think that sort of historiography helps you to think about um, artistic production in that way. And it's important um, to have that sort of levels of nuance uh, in the way you think about it. Otherwise you end up with a very sort of causal interpretation of things. And I just wanted to, well, like, to get into the material, I just wanted to look at this question which Bruno raises in the text, um, which I think is very important. To what extent can we say the things that happen in 1909 to 1920 as a result of the futurist movement, which are sort of quasi-political, aesthetic sort of um, theses that they put out into the world, to what extent can you say there's a sort of causal connection between that and militarism and the aestheticization of the military regime under the fascist um, regime in Italy and eventually war, the mobilization of the mass of Italian society uh, to engage in military activity. I would say there isn't, a, <laughs> there isn't a connection. And my proof, my evidence in relation to this is um, in this building, which it, it constitutes the argument that you know, architectural production, you could say the same to lots of other kinds of art, uh, works, um, operates pretty autonomously. That doesn't mean it's not influenced by these things, uh, but to a certain extent, you certainly would not want to make a correlation between uh, 
uh, the political culture that gives rise to an idea uh, and the quality of that idea. Those two things are quite separate. This is probably one of the most influential buildings in the 20th century. Is, is anybody here familiar with it? <laughs> um, you might look at it and think that's oh, it's just some horrible thing in the history somewhere. Um, but I included it because it's not one of the key buildings that people use to sort of say, look how good the production of Italian fascism was in terms of how great Because they did produce quite a lot of exquisitely beautiful buildings. If you've been to the railway station in Florence, you will have, you know, you will have held your breath a little bit and felt some sense of being moved by architecture, even if you hate modernist architecture in general rule. This is the Casa of Fascism by Giuseppe Taragni, uh, and it took quite a long time to complete, but it was completed by 36. And for the benefit of people who are interested in architecture, I've got a plan and a couple of axonometrics in there. For the benefit of people that are not interested in modern architecture, um, that really was just to give you a sense of the control, you can get that from the images, the level of uh, control, order, sense of human uh, capacity to organize things according to some sense of rules and propriety and proportion. I don't know whether you can get that from looking at this plan, maybe this doesn't mean much to you, but maybe from the axonometrics you can see um, that this individual is somebody who that exists within the tradition uh, of Michelangelo. He exists within a tradition which is about the exquisite control of spatial form uh, and, and relationships. And I'm, I'm getting more poetic about it because I want to counterbalance the idea which Bruno expressed, if you talk to me about this, which is that modernism is really just wrong. That the cultural production that comes out of the movement, uh, the, the moment uh, after 1909 has a sort of drawn aspect and a lack of appeal um, to the public. Um, so this is highly influential. If you go uh, into the American schools of architecture, you'll find that this building um, was very significant. And just to um, give you a bit more, there's the context in Como, the mountains in the background. See this picture here. This man has a profound sense of historical continuity and his relationship to the traditions of public life of Renaissance Italy. Now, you can read that in that plan. There's your building up there. The relationship between the building and that space where it says A is an atrium space. So the entrance and the processional process of coming into this building is one of the most important things. It then has a sphere outside of that. In the public square, it's square it serves from this church, which is about the collection of people in a highly controlled and aestheticized way, which is a feature in the life of uh, fascist architecture. But it's also a feature uh, of architecture, <laughs> historically. Uh, you know, the question of how you enter a building is one that affects the idea of architecture and imagination for a very long period of time. The relationship between the Renaissance humanism and the fascist um, sort of modernist building uh, is, is a sort of one that's been clearly articulated by this individual. And now I'm laboring this a bit, but um, I just want to make really clear that um, you can look at this work and you can really appreciate it in its own terms and on a sort of autonomous viewpoint. And you can also appreciate how this particular um, architectural expression um, does have a certain particular purchase on the needs of uh, fascist regime in the early 30s. So, fascinatingly, the Italians have um, had sort of a little bit of trouble with uh, their modernist architecture. Only architects were enthusiastic about the modernist architecture. But there's been a sort of um, rehabilitation of fascist architecture work in Italy. I would say over the last 15 years, people started to write books about Taragni, who was a sort of considered a non person for a little while. And this I find very interesting in relation to the discussion we had at the beginning about Louis XIV. So this is this building dressed to impress Hitler on his visit to Como. Uh, and Hitler um, was supposed to have very conservative taste and not like one of those buildings. And this is uh, the building today where the local Italian authorities have decided to celebrate the architect who designed the building for fascists. Creativity, in other words, the sort of the 
modern equivalent of how Italy projects itself is creative and modernist. So, that, so to me that's very interesting. But the building itself lends itself um, to a certain extent to be a public expression of a sentiment. But it can be more than one sentiment. And I think if you like that proves my point that um, you can't really assume that um, buildings or art forms in particular carry intrinsically within them a certain political social outlook. We can know what the intentions of the artist at the point is made, we can know how it gets read and understood and its impact on society as society unfolds, uh, and we can know how we understand it in retrospect. Um, but to imagine that embodied within this, there is anything other than the lessons of the discipline itself, or as politically, um, is problematic. Um, um, just to reiterate that point, these, this is um, another precious modernist building, um, one of the colonies um, in the um, uh, sort of in the from the late twenties to the thirties, um, Mussolini engaged in the project of. Uh, uh, sort of an important project of um, draining uh, marshland on the coast of Italy, which was seen as very important in terms of the uh, dispelling of malaria and the sort of uh, creating of an infrastructure in rural Italy. And part of that program was led by the creation of these camps for children. And um, basically, uh, what they did was they would take children of skilled working class people. Uh, from the cities, put them on the coast for the summer, and they would um, socialise them. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting because that socialisation has a particularly strong kind of aesthetic connotation. So if you look at the form here, all of these colony buildings have this incredible um, ceremonial, um, ritualistic uh, staircases and uh, open grounds in front of them. They're very much about using some kind of uh, aesthetic language in order to try to generate the kind of props and the frameworks and the ideas that could uh, allow them to sort of generate in some people a sense of uh, modernity. It's a very um, interesting subject from that point of view how they did it. Didn't always have the same aesthetic output. Sometimes it was much more expressive. These were designed to be seen from the air. So when we flew over in the aeroplane, we saw this building which impersonated an aeroplane. Uh, and it's obviously much more plastic in terms of its form. It doesn't conform to our historical idea of what, um, what uh, the associated model is. Okay, really now, sorry it's taken so long to get there, I'm going to talk about the uh, movement. Um, Um, you probably are familiar with this picture. Um, this is a picture of um, a meeting of the futurists. And um, I suppose it sort of captures the whole chaotic, slightly adolescent um, dynamic, this dynamic is something they're very interested in, character of uh, the futurist movement. Even calling it a movement is probably a, a little bit generous. I mean, it's a movement culturally, um, but it's certainly not a political movement, it's a sort of halfway house uh, in the same way as we get to sort of a lot of collections of people coming together around texts in that period. Um, if you look at Paris, in fact, the kind of way in which everybody's churning out kind of theatre on sort of week by week basis um, to explain how they feel uh, art is relevant in the contemporary society. Uh, this is very much an expression of um, Marinetti single handedly, as far as I understand, brings this collection of ideas together as a futurist program. So for example, St. Elia, you will have seen images that he produced of the new city, um, didn't actually even put futurism in his, um, in his text Marinetti after his death, posthumously, uh, before, or, or no, not after his death actually, uh, but in his absence, <laughs> uh, puts the word futurist in substitution for the word new in Places. So it's, a, it's not a movement in that coherent sense, it's about a collection of individuals who are clearly extremely animated 
did um, about um, the conditions in which they find themselves. And they produce um, a whole series um, of um, publications over a period um, of about 10 years, um, which look at everything from uh, the basic principles itself to music, to photography, uh, to the theatre, to cinema, to the nature of form, class the plasticity of form, to sculpture, um, to questions of mechanical production on, on the more technological side, to questions of the city, which is St. Elia, um, and particularly to sort of issues of um, theatre, and um, people will have read probably some of this material, um, and the um, construction of language, uh, the development of poetry, uh, and particularly um, issues um, relating to um, the question of the artist in relation to uh, production and all these different forms. So, what is futurism? Futurism is a collection of individuals who are talking to other individuals across Europe who constitute an important element within the um, European avant-garde at this time, who are trying to, through their artistic output, make sense of uh, the experiences they're having. And as a result of that, there is a sort of heady mixture of different things. <coughs> this represents uh, a very short-lived moment in history in which um, certain particular ideas have kind of coherent <coughs> expression, which we would call futurism. So what are those coherent uh, ideas and what are the problems with them? These are some of the key players. Um, and um, one of the things that is interesting if you look at the Futurist Manifesto, the first document, the family document of 1909, uh, is that although the futurists don't write stories, there are no futurist novels, there are, there are no narratives because they don't like reflection, they're, not inter they're interested in now and the expression of ideas in the present, um, and they have a strong strand of anti-intellectualism. Despite that, in that first document, the family document, Marinetti takes us on a little journey and he describes how they go from that meeting, I've just shown you, all of them having a world time, making big noises and uh, spouting off, and they go um, from there and they all get in the car drunk and they drive out into the countryside and they crash in a ditch. And then they have to get some peasants to pull them out of the ditch, um, and the peasants are looking on a bit confused, and then they return home um, with um, sort of a black grease all over their faces, even though they haven't actually done a leg to get the <laughs> <laughs> uh, And they're really excited about this direct engagement uh, with this new power, this new technological power of the car. And it's interesting because as members of a sort of intellectual class during this period, this is actually the first time. They're not workers, these people. This is the first time through the car that they have had this direct experience of controlling uh, mechanical power. And so, unless you were a factory owner or something, you wouldn't have had that kind of experience in the past. And they're incredibly uh, excited about it. Um, and uh, so, when you see Marinetti, which is the, here, you quite often see him with, the, uh, with his car or with his goggles on where he's just come out of the car or whatever else. There's this absolute preoccupation uh, with the um, potential of speed and the kind of contingency that's generated in every area of life and the mobility that's created through speed. And normally when I talk to my students, I would talk about that incredible sense of mobility and contingency. Um, but I have to say that in the current climate, I would think again about that. Um, not that there's a problem with mobility, but certainly the fetishization of contingency and also the fetishization of mechanics and technology uh, is probably um, one of the key um, downsides, one of the key criticisms we would want to make, I think, uh, of, um, the, um, of the movement. So, as I said, there are a number of different individuals. Each individual who uh, seems to be associated with a, a discipline, so how do you say this, Boccioni. 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 Um, Boccioni in sculpture, Marinetti uh, in writing, St. Elia in, in, in relation to architecture. They're not all staying together, by the way, but they all have the disciplines they're looking at. They write these manifestos and they codify certain ideas, uh, and these ideas are codified um, and have a certain collective uh, coherence. <laughs> 
I don't know whether people did look at the literature, but this is very significant if you're interested in graphic design, I think, this moment. Because at the moment in which you are starting to develop technology which allows you an incredible amount of control over typefaces and production and creativity, uh, these guys explore the possibility of uh, onomatopoeic graphics, if you like. In other words, they use the form of the word to express the quality of the noise. Uh, and, and so um, I included that because I think that's a moment which is really fascinating and interesting and has probably influenced graphic designers for the last hundred years since it happened. Uh, so I'm not saying everything is bad about this uh, output and there's interesting things about it and the people that are more interested in it from a poetry point of view will have these interests and say but it's also um, problematic. Um, the uh, painting as an expression of contingency, speed, mechanisation, uh, you probably get a sense of that in this, in this image. Uh, Bala, I think, is probably one of the less interesting painters of this time. Uh, he's clearly um, uh, engaged in a kind of a, a dialogue with painters in, in Paris and is uh, very much part of a, an attempt for, by uh, artists to um, capture the sense of dynamism in society at that moment. He does it usually through the exploration of technology. Santelia, we've already talked about. Santelia's work, um, which is really just a collection of, um, fantastic collection of drawings um, that he produces quite late on for an exhibition, and then Marinetti sort of orchestrates that into a manifesto, are, um, have a sort of art deco quality to them, I think. They don't look like uh, necessarily modern buildings. There's a kind of relationship with the things that they're criticizing that exist in Europe at the end of that century more that they have kind of arts and craft and quality to them. But clearly in terms of the content, he is thinking about the reorganization of the city and the reorganization of society as a consequence of increased mobility um, at a very strategic and imaginative level and there's um, those things that really interest me. So do people know this image? Yes? I mean it, it assumes um, lift technology here. It assumes that you organize transport on a number of different levels. It assumes that you collect together different functions that you no longer separate out residential areas from um, commercial and productive areas. So it's a kind of, kind of entire reimagining uh, of the city at that moment. I think it's 1914. Uh, can I still get two minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so I put this in to force myself to sort of um, say what I actually thought. <clears throat> I'm going to make these points and I'm going to illustrate them. There is, um, there is an incredible quality about this thing, the, this work that's produced in this period under the title of futurism, which I would not um, in any way want to disparage. And I think it's very important for people to look at um, that work in its own terms and appreciate it in its own terms. However, if we were to um, choose to make a judgment about it um, in terms of what the consequences of um, some of these ideas might be, what they represent, or what the, the strands of thinking that they express, um, I think these are probably some of the things that it is worth saying about it because this is open for discussion. The key thing that is very, very strong comes across very clearly in all of the futurist manifestos is um, a real um, distaste for the past. Um, and I think this relates, this is where this session really relates to some of the discussions we've been having over the weekend. So I love Marinetti primarily because I can't believe how great he is in his attack on Ruskin. Um, <laughs> Ruskin, does everyone most people know who Ruskin is? That old Victorian gentleman that said that we didn't want to go railways into the late district. <coughs> mean that the working class was supported for the rest of us. Um, Marinetti talks about passeism. Is that the right pronunciation? Passeism. Passeism. <coughs> the occupation with the past. And he says that this moment in history where he's talking about um, 
People like Ruskin have turned Italy, or certainly cities in Italy like Venice, into the love room of Europe. In other words, they're sort of, you go there to experience your romantic sensations, and the poor Italians are getting on with trying to develop a real society, and Ruskin and his friends are sort of like being terribly aesthetic and creating these very beautiful drawings. This quote is one of the nastiest quotes that I've read in this sort of discipline I like. With his sick dream of primitive pastoral life, with his nostalgia for Homeric cheeses and luxury <coughs> spinning wheels, with his hatred of the machine, of steam and electricity, this maniac for antique simplicity resembles a man who, in full maturity, wants to sleep in his cot again and drink at the breast of his nurse, who has grown old in order to regain a carefree state of infancy. So it's a very slight unpleasant image there of uh, Ruskin sucking on the, on the breast of his old nanny. Um, it's, very, it's very vicious and there's a correctness in it, isn't there? So to me there's a, there's a truth in that, but there's also not a truth in it. And there's also a real serious problem with it. So, um, uh, if you look at that discussion more broadly uh, in society at the time, um, there is clearly a desire to put behind them the institutional restraints on exploration and experimentation. This is called de Grotius writing with the young formation of Bauhaus. And that is a legitimate aspiration. And in fact, when Gropius does it, um, I kind of am vaguely sympathetic, <laughs> probably I'm very subjectively I have a more sympathetic attitude towards Grotius. But when uh, the futurists talk about this, it is consistently a highly destructive and nihilistic attitude towards the past, uh, which leaves you nothing really. And, and in a way that's why I put this my first point, are they really, sorry, are they really um, futurists? My second point, well, no, they're presentist. They have a very strong sense of the moment, the sensation. Uh, they've got an adolescent quality to them. The fact that futurism always seems to be about shouting. That reminds me of somebody in the room here who, <laughs> who uh, doesn't have an understanding of the past or an attitude to the future which allows them to articulate any sense of how you might move forward has a very um, uh, aggressive and sometimes brilliantly insightful analysis of what is happening in the here and now, um, but doesn't have an avenue out of the situation yet. So, um, so there's a kind of um, there's a problem with futurism um, uh, as a, an outlook for some of the work that's produced in that in that critique of passeism and Ruskin and Romanticism, uh, they're extremely one-sided and they lose something in that process. And actually, they begin to fetishize and institutionalize anti-intellectualism, anti-the academy. Rather than seeing a need to transform the academy, uh, they just argue that all museums should be closed down. All academic institutions should just be burned down and thrown out. And I, I, again, I show this to my students in the week, it's been I'm trying to be really radical in the kit. But actually, seriously, what I should be doing is saying, if you believe this now, it's highly problematic because, in fact, the, the issue that presents us at the moment is how do we engage with the past in a way which is more meaningful. So, um, beware, if you like, enthusiasm for um, this kind of sentiment now. I mean, I think it's important that we use it to understand how much people were keen to disassociate with the past, and why you do get that really profound sense of a historic break. Um, and why that profound sense of a historic break uh, takes a cultural form. It takes a cultural form clearly because um, it's an unrealized transformation. There's not a revolution in society, there's a revolution in the way we think about artistic production. So you could say it's a sort of latent, uh, sort of, it's a legacy of the unfulfilled transformation of things, is that within culture we find ways of sort of suggesting that we tell everything on its head. Um, this um, really, if you like, um, encapsulates for me both what's great about this period, so I feel that this tower at the end of the 19th century. Marinetti is obsessed with Paris, he sees Paris as the centre of the human 
universe and he sees uh, telegraphic um, communication, which is what physical, which has this sort of ethereal quality to it as uh, the basis on which um, you can start to think about futures. And so the fact that the Eiffel Tower is used to project messages all around the world is something that he's incredibly uh, excited about. But that sort of telegraphic lyricism, which um, if you looked at it, you've seen some reporting of in the literature, um, is really um, taken to sort of uh, a, a, an extreme, if you like. Marinetti says that he would rather see a building uh, in an unfinished state. So he's, he's preoccupied with the idea of seeing things uh, as transient, as becoming. The fanaticism with technology is linked to a preoccupation with the idea of everything constantly uh, moving forward. It's a very technical view of progress, not as human emancipation, uh, but as a, a process of things shifting constantly. So to codify the experience of modernism, and he would prefer to see this building like this than this building completed. I don't know how you feel about that. Lots of architects would be feel the same way because they like the idea of things in the process of becoming, uh, and certainly the, um, the process is quite interesting. Um, but it tells us something about Marinetti, I think, that he feels like that. Um, the Tatman Tower, futurists in uh, uh, futurists who are linked really to constructivism, it becomes constructivism in the Soviet Union, also are attempting to capture through architecture form that sense of dynamism and that sense of becoming, um, but it has a different um, kind of expression and they actually do it in the Soviet Union. Futurism isn't about doing it, it's about doing it. About doing it. And then in Germany, uh, in the other strand of modernism, um, expressionism, um, people um, are also trying to do this thing, to give expression to new science and new technology. This is uh, Eric Mendelssohn's um, tribute to Einstein uh, to mark the development of the theory of relativity. It's a, it's a place we call the stars. Uh, but they actually evolved in a political struggle and a public subscription. They build a building to celebrate relativity. And it has a form which is much more plastic. You see that much more sculptural much less about utilitarianism and simplicity. So, I suppose the important thing about futurism is that there are lots of ideas expressed by the avant-garde in this period. The problem with futurism is that where um, it gives expression to things, it tends to be uh, the more anti-humanistic side of things. And I'm just going to sort of finish on that, on, on, on that. Like These individuals are also expressing sense of movement, dynamic contingency in architecture, uh, the sense of things moving apart, um, but it has a more, it has a greater sense of coherence to it, I think. Um, this is an exploration of the possibilities of light, film, time, changing attitudes towards time by Macaulay Nagy at the Bauhaus, uh, uh, and, and it's a very interesting piece of uh, cultural work, um, but it has a sort of um, it has a slightly more engaged quality to it that, that I think than the futurist. And similarly, Adolf Luce writing ornament and crime, criticizing uh, the use of ornament in architectural production at exactly the same period as the futurist, actually then goes on to uh, develop um, buildings within this, this framework. Um, right, I can't talk about these uh, other things, but the one thing that I really want to stress in relation to this is probably the point that I just made about humanity. If you look at the futurist discussion of theatre, I think it's very interesting. Some of the texts stress the fact that they use mannequins a lot. But about this is an interesting balance. The balance also use mannequins a lot in, in theatre. There's that idea of uh, just as the author is displaced from poetry, and you don't talk about the eye in the of poetry. Similarly, in um, theatre, you have a lot of new ideas which actually take the actor out of the core role in the centre of theatre, which is interesting. Um, and maybe you can know about this. So there's the introduction of mannequins in quite a lot of futurist theatre. There's a discussion about man uh, loving machine, appreciating machine, and man becoming machine, man as robot, which is also expressed in a lot of futurist literature. Man as a mechanism. Man understanding his own biological processes 
through a mechanistic um, metaphor. This is the total theatre which Gropius and uh, others uh, worked on. And, uh, in this period, the same period, there's a lot of discussion in Europe about theatre because you've got cinema coming in and you've got bigger audiences and you don't want uh, the forms of your theatres uh, to reinforce this bourgeois stereotypes of what theatre are about. That's the contemporary language. The Total Theatre, I always thought, is one of the most exciting pieces of architectural exploration and experimentation ever. But having looked at it now, again, in a slightly different light, I realise that it's actually about the absence of humanity. It's a, it's a technical solution to the question of how you deal with uh, a new theatre form which is shifting, which has a different relationship to audience, which has an incredible amount of technology in terms of how you can move things around with light and these autom automatic uh, processes. But at its core, this thing which I've always thought is you know, the high point of human achievement in the 20th century, Actually, it's deeply anti-humanistic, um, and um, this guy, um, who was working on the same process at the same time, uh, Maya Holt, um, is also exploring how we can think in the age of um, mechanical production, expansion, how we can think about theatre in a deep new way. And the stage is transformed, and the character of the theatre is transformed, and they attempt to capture that sense of movement. But if you look at the literature, it's all about, even within the Russian constructivist, it's all about actually uh, shifting the emphasis from the human being to the mechanical. And if you like, I'll just finish on this, it's very interesting uh, idea that he's exploring, and a sense of movement that he's exploring. This um, product, this idea of the development on the idea of the total theatre, which is explored uh, by Meyerhold, um, it. And to me that kind of sums up sort of uh, lots of things that I've talked about that I need to finish with. Um, but at the core it's the fetishization of production and mechanics by a professional class who are interested in their professional uh, specific expertise in their world, uh, which leads them to a position whereby, um, I don't want to say there's an emptying out, um, but these um, Architectural and artistic expression give form to ideas that exist, but they can't sustain them in the absence of the real transformation of society, and therefore the form has a certain emptiness that allows it to be appropriate. We've got better than to appropriate there. <laughs> Uh, manifesto in 1909 
was uh, uh, featured on the front page of the Figaro in Paris. So, you know, you can see that real efforts were made to take the movement outside Italy, but ultimately I think they were, they were too weak outside Italy. So that's the first problem. And the second one is uh, the fact that they were, you know, uh, artistic figures. And it seems to me that very often they fell out over fairly subjective artistic questions, and that often got in the way of the politics. Uh, but probably, you know, you can maybe say a bit more about that because that would be interesting. But I think the final thing um, that I have a problem with the, the futurists is, is the chauvinistic character uh, of their message that they not only wanted uh, uh, an industrial uh, modern world, but they wanted a, a nationalistic um, and military um, machine. And I think, you know, you raise that question, um, is there a link between futurism and fascism and war, uh, I agree with you there's not a direct link, but I think there is an indirect link. Um, you know, in many ways the futurists were defeated by uh, Gabriele Di Nuzio uh, and Mussolini, who almost out the chauvinistic character of their movement. So I think that they do, in some ways, lay the groundwork uh, for fascism. Uh, in that way, so uh, I don't think it's a direct one, uh, but my name is an indirect one, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on that too. Yeah, no, that's okay. Just an observation on this one rather interesting idea of becoming the Marinette is intro, more interested in the Eiffel Tower is not finished than when it is. I mean, I can understand the affection and the interest in, the, in that. I mean, some people will sometimes say they prefer to see a play rehearsed or a piece of music rehearsed and actually performed. But on the other hand, the, these things are meant to work. I mean, obviously, the, the Eiffel Tower presumably couldn't send telegraph messages around the world if it hadn't got the top on. Uh, those penguins would presumably waddle away if they didn't have a wall around them. So, the, the, so, so really, the idea that they're perhaps if they're ready, their heart is with the unfinished, but their head maybe is with the finished perfect machine that's working with them. Elizabeth? Um, um, Penny, thank you so much. It was a really good and refreshing. And uh, to be honest with you, I, I feel sorry for the futurists. <laughs> because if you think, you know, these are middle class intellectuals, very young guys, uh, beginning of the century, after 40 years that the political elite is coming out saying, we, we have to do Italy and, uh, you know, we have to uh, modernize uh, agriculture, we have to industrialize, uh, clear up, uh, uh, unify the, the languages. Still, you know, the literature is about talking about the South uh, in, uh, you know, targeting how uh, malaria, cholera is killing everybody. In the first 10 years of the 20th century, you have uh, millions of people live in Italy and, uh, you know, emigrating to the Americans, live in Italy in a state really of uh, no manpower to work, uh, just, uh, you know, the um, uh, um, few um, uh, lands and farms that are around. So these guys are really fed up, you know. And of course, they say, let's get rid of the past, let's get rid of everybody, everybody kill everybody. Unfortunately, as uh, you know, they were against their proper class, uh, yeah. but they have no industrial working class uh, to fall on. So there was no possibility for them to embrace uh, another type of future future project that maybe was uh, uh, for sure offered, uh, you know, by a, a working class. So they they then fall out in a vacuum, and 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 they are really adolescent. And they are really to be hated because, you know, unfortunately, their wonderful potential falls out on nothing. They have no project, you know, and just this glamorization. And I'm so angry with them as well because how can you go through a war that was, you know, the most uh, really cr um, crude example of how technology actually, you know, can have a destructive type of side effect? Because it's the first time in, in, uh, in a young time that you have the implementation of really a, 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 a war done by weapons that no one knows. And 
you know, the effect is to disintegrate the body in a country that is uh, Catholic and worship the body. So that would have a great, great impact. And they come out just saying, let's uh, celebrate the war. And, you know, they make a spectacle of the war. But then, yeah, it was, was, was very good and picked up by fascists because, you know, it was a way to, okay, we, we, we failed in 1961, but this war was useful because the blood is like, uh, you know, the, the, the regenerating water for the new Italy. But, uh, you know, hey, who are you? <laughs> so, okay. so. Right. One more, then I'll take another round. <laughs> right. You're all completely wrong. <laughs>
the, the, the highly nihilistic and highly concerned with drive. So there's one of those manifestos is about lust, isn't it? Is the one that one? Yeah. yeah. Uh, lust like pride is a powerful source of energy. There's no aesthetic theory at all in any of their writings, really, except for maybe some of the discussion that Paul Chiumi talks about in terms of plasticity and in sculpture. Um, so there's no framework we have that they provide that allows us to discuss beauty. But there is this kind of short telegraphic statement, you know, lust is, it's, it's sort of, it's propaganda without any, any content, which um, is problematic, I think. I also think that there's a confusion there, which is my confusion that I gave to you. Futurism is these guys, the avant-garde, including the Einstein Tower, which is produced by Eric Mendelssohn, who's part of German Expressionism, is not futurism. It's um, people that are trying to rewrite the rules of uh, artistic production at the same time. And of course they're connected. And of course individuals cooperate in these things. But I kind of have a positive attitude towards elements of the avant-garde, and I have a positive attitude towards most of futurism, but I think it's worth um, being critical um, about. Sorry. Right. Um, the things that I didn't talk about was war. Um, I, I was conscious that I didn't talk about war, any of the stuff that's really talked about in the, in the book. Um, but I don't accept, Dominic, this idea that, they, that the problem with them is that they will confined to Italy. That assumes that they have this great political program which we all want them to roll out with the rest of the world. As I say, they're just an expression of certain positive impulses and certain negative impulses that exist at that moment in time. And I wouldn't want them to roll out a political program particularly. That assumes that they kind of are in a way a kernel of some kind of revolutionary movement. But as Trotsky says in that reading, you know, that's happening somewhere else. These people have a relationship with it, but they're not it, and they're not substitutes. So that, that would be my response to that. Um, the thing that I think is really interesting, if you look at Manfredo Tafuri, he uh, has this idea, which I think is quite good, where he sort of says, this professional class, the architects, the engineers, uh, the people that open the artistic meaning, what they do in the post-war period um, is that as a professional class, they reorganize capitalism for them. So they provide an intellectual framework and a sense of order and meaning to the restructuring of capital, particularly in relation to something like the city. In other words, these guys trained in the sense of possibility in the pre-war period, uh, when that possibility is closed down, these guys are still around with their dynamic thrusting ideas, and that then becomes appropriated talk about how we do post-war reconstruction. So he's really saying they're just the tools of the bourgeoisie and the reorganization of meaning in post-war life. Now, when I say it, I know I sound like an Italian world, so it's rude. But I think he has a point, actually. Because if you think about something like Le Corbusier, who I love, you know, I passionately adore his work, um, if you look at the kind of when he poses the question at the same moment in history, it's reform or revolution, either we resolve the housing question or we go into chaos. And then you look at the way in which he forms the discussion about post-war planning. He's a classic example of an intellectual, sort of a professional class forged in the white heat of the 1970 and then made into something that can give a modernist kind of framework to post-war reconstruction. And that, you know, the best of this is in the US, where people say all those emigres that existed with the futurists around this period who disappeared because of the uh, threat, most of them were Jewish, and went to the US and sort of set up their own university schools of art and architecture. All those guys, they basically took the dressing of modernism and gave it to commercial in, in America in order for America to refresh its sense of being a, a, a modern, trusting nation. So they provide the aesthetic framework, if you like, for reorganization. That idea has been quite popularly discussed, the appropriation, the emptying out of the social content of modernism in post-war American society. That's what it is. But nobody ever says that about Europe, interestingly. They hate Corbusier, but they don't know why, and they hate him more reasons. I don't think I want to Yes, Okay. Uh, yeah, I uh, really have 
about the front asset question because one of the things that I really struggle with with this is that I think I kind of get the whole point about the, the functionality and that sort of sense of experimentation and the use of space and materials and looking at how that pushed forward. But where I, I just don't get it is whether there is sort of what the place is of the aesthetic in that, and almost the aesthetic as a form, if you, you know what I mean. You started to talk a little bit about plasticity, and it seems to me maybe that's touching on that a bit, but can you say a bit more about that? And then the second question is, um, which touches on to Dominic's point, is why Italy, actually, rather than, say, Germany or Russia or why Italy? Is it something to do with a reaction, ironically, to Italy as the, the centre of the Renaissance, and there's that, that great picture that you showed of the, the Taragni building in Como, where you've got this sort of fantastic structure, and then there's this wonderful thing about it framing that wonderful Renaissance building. Is there something about the emergence of or the, the, the centering of this in Italy as being a kind of kickback against Italy as the centre of the Renaissance. I am oh, fantastic lecture. Really good. Well, just on my own second point, and, and then a, a broader point. Uh, I think, Penny, it was fantastic talk. I think that when Elisabetta says, uh, draws attention to how fed up the futurists were with late 19th century, early 20th century Italy. I think it could have underlined that a little bit more, if I might suggest, because for me, the whole obsession with speed is about getting away from Vittorio Emanuele and the decayed monarchy and all of that. And that's why they go on so much about the past, as Elisabetta said, and the smell of the past, they're quite big on that. And, you know, one must sympathize with them, and that's the answer to Anne's question. I'm not so sure it has to do with the Renaissance so much as that Italy unified late, but didn't have Germany's industry. Russia was even more backwards. So you only could have a, a Russian futurist, namely the constructuralists after the Bolsheviks. You, you had premonitions of that uh, with um, uh, stepping over and pop over uh, before the war. They were always stepping over and popping over. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, the Italy was where the contradiction between the Ancien Regime and modernity was very advanced in Europe. A, a related question which, Alan, maybe you would come back on is, to what extent did the futurists in some way reflect the weakness of the left, the lateness of the formation of Italian leftism and its fairly conservative uh, quality, both in the socialist and in the communist domain? And I wonder whether they, uh, Gramsci wrote about the futurists or they about, about him and what was happening there. Um, but the, the wider point I wanted to make, which is, uh, you know, a little bit in sympathy uh, with our friend at the front, not about meaning, but um, uh, I'm also against our friend in the front. Um, you know, I think the uh, futurists did some brilliant art. I'm surprised by your opinion of Giacomo Bala, of all people. Right? One, of, one of the greats, in, and he's always appearing in, in my lectures so much so I love him. Numbers in, numbers in love, where I've got a whole if you want me to get to the projector, I've got them all here. But I mean, he idealized the railways, terrific as far as I'm concerned. He didn't really idealize bombing people from great heights, which is what most of the futurists did, you know, especially to Abyssinians and all of that. The big, and it wasn't just the military, but they really reveled in, in bombing and all of that. Um, and I think in the post-war futurists, especially in graphic design, Dudovich for Fiat, Codognato and Cironi, you know, and, and, and Nizzoli, who did all those Campari ads in the early 50s. You know, they, um, if you see Nizzoli's picture of an Orangina bottle, you know, you want to drink the poster. And, uh, and, and the same with Campari. And that very much showed the influence of the futurists. So I think at the, uh, also you've got these futurist waistcoats. You talked about products but didn't show any. You know, futurist furniture, futurist waistcoats. It's just out of sight, and it's entirely contemporary, like the constructivists. So, were they reactionary? Yes. Were they a movement? No. Did they all turn into fascists? Yes. Bunch of bastards? Yes. Modernists? Also reactionary bastards. 
right? But he didn't prevent either of them doing some fantastic work, you know. Just because we don't like the politics, as he rightly said, you know, doesn't mean we don't like the work. And I think it's a little better than what he credited. Yes, sorry. Yes. Um, his work is going back to this question of meaning, and also connected to that point about whether it is actually, the art is actually beautiful to, to see that But um, I was very interested in the modernism and fascism model, and how both those things arose from the loss of sort of a, a sense of perhaps purpose in, in life that, that arose with modernity. And, and, and these were movements that completely against the tradition of modernity as much as things that had gone before it. That, that was part of the past that they were that they were reacting against in a way. But I, I was just wondering, uh, to, we have these in, in the book we have two forms of of modernism. In that you've got the more political modernism and then the more artistic modernism. And you saw how the, the political modernism was able to to use that general feeling amongst the population uh, in order to to bring about new political movements like the fascists. But to what extent will the future is successful in engaging with that, 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 that feeling of, of a loss of purpose in modernity amongst the general population? And how, to what extent is their art successful in engaging with that in, in, in ordinary people? Because obviously it's all about uh, making all these artistic works. But did, were people in Italy at the time engaged with, with that art? Did they appreciate that art? Or did, or did they find it quite cold and, and, and unhuman? To, to Just very quickly, the part of James's point. I, I, I don't think perhaps she wrote about the futurists, but you should, well, I think you should remember that although it's essentially right about the end of the other community and Germany and Russia, but all three of those countries had very rapid industrial development in small pockets, mm -hmm. so that they were able to see Geneva and Milan, yeah, which were entirely different from the Pontine marshes and everything. Giorno, everything south of Rome. So there were exemplars of this the possibility. And then you have to see the argument, well, and as it's wrong, is that you then get these three movements, largely in those three countries and less in the others, all of which then produce authoritarian regimes. Right? And that's a very common, I mean, I've got time to unravel that. It's, a, it's an erroneous argument, but it's, a, it's, a, it's the artistic expression of the, of the extreme levels of political conflict occasioned by rapid modernization mm -hmm. in, new, in new places. And the very one last point, I mean, it's a terrible thing, it's an adolescent thing, of course, but the destruction of war is the most effective way of getting rid of the past. Yeah? That's what you, if you get, if, if, if you just destroy it, you can start again, and you get the same characteristic, you know, in other aspects. If you think of the, the anarchist in German Al who gets rid of the coal mine, or if you think of, you know, the most uh, nihilistic figure in the Magic Mountain, um, I thought uh, something very early on, Penny, that you um, referred to, which is the kind of the, the, the new interest, the contemporary interest in um, in futurists, and uh, the, the 2009 Tate uh, exhibition, which marked the centenary of the birth of futurism. And, and you know there is, and I, I sort of like to reconsider that because there is a, a huge irony, of course, in a kind of aesthetic return to a futurist past. <laughs> I think it also, however, says it raises the question: what is the legacy of futurism? Where did it go? And certainly, in, in the contemporary art world, um, I feel it gives the, 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 the kind of fascination with futurism. Um, is a way of giving meaning to um, inertia and to the, um, the the endless process, which is you know where where it can seem to be in um, in artistic production. Um, and I think it also um, it, it's rather an odd um, um, interest because on the one hand there is a it, it kind of chimes with the contemporary anti-intellectualism and with the contemporary inertia and an and endless process. But it also, um, basically, this sort of interest in the fetishization of technology then has to be reinterpreted as kind of ironic <coughs> in the current climate. So really, just to, um, to, to acknowledge that, um, and, and, 
that uh, reference you made early on. And I think it is an area of, um, that can be considered. Um, uh, One more, and then. Okay. All right. Uh, first, thank you very much for getting the extraordinary and uh, well researched and well performed lecture. Like, uh, I myself, I feel that futurism, in terms of its uh, lineage and its legacy, has certainly left a um, uh, permanent uh, mark within, say, steampunk or cyberpunk. Within what? Uh, steampunk. Cyberpunk, uh, I'm not sure the yeah, yeah. these things are around right there. And, and how I saw futurism presented, and I criticised the, uh, the statement you made about saying it's a purely persistent or a right wing authoritarian or radical righteous tradition. Um, I remember reading somewhere, I can't remember who said it now, but uh, communism is the science of the engineer, or the politics of the engineer, is what I'm saying. And it seemed that the futurists saw modernity, they saw it for what it was, and they realised that there was something in it. Cars. They saw the world change around them. Their parents probably, you know, didn't like it. They were reacting towards it. Whereas they, in their adolescence, as you say, you know, moved themselves towards it. It was fun. It was exciting. You know, it made loud noises. They could, uh, um, uh, they found it incredibly exciting. But at the same time, they didn't like the aspect of the future in terms of what it could create in like, maybe welfare states, perhaps, or maybe the. Uh, uh, you know, people literally being industrialised and um, uh, slaughtered on the, on the Western Front. In many ways, I would say, perhaps adding to that, uh, the First World War, not, not the Second World War, the First World War, looking at that war back in the Great War, as it was called, the war to end all wars, uh, it was that kind of conflict, one could say, that man, man's very soul was being formed, and how they saw it to be the case. And uh, it was always, it, and it was going to change human experience and human condition forever. It caused humanity to question so in that conflict, not the second war, the first one. Uh, the uh, Richard Lyons, the author of uh, uh, Dying to Defend One's Country, One's King, One Monarchy, all these things that they really didn't believe in. They, they didn't mean anything to them. They, they seemed to be excited and, uh, uh, and enjoy the concept of looking upon the machine rather than the human. And so, in that sense, they kind of like uh, dehumanize themselves in the process of that metamorphosis of trying to. Uh, bind humanity and uh, all, um, all the organism with the mechanic. And so in that kind of like duality of the situation, uh, they kind of present themselves as this kind of strange response. And you can read that either as a persistent way or perhaps even a communist way. Like it, it was it was simply something that is purely misanthropic in a way. Like it, it was very difficult to kind of uh, discern in any other nature. You couldn't really feel sympathy with it. Uh, as, as the gentleman friend said, there was, they perceived no beauty in their art, or they perceived it as uh, something to be the very definition of beauty itself being uh, identified in a more distinct way than before in the past. Others and their parents certainly perceived beauty to be no longer was it going to be classical buildings, no longer was it going to be castles. It was going so to be parents. So but yes, I'll lose my point. I'm going to, 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 to place the syntax in the beginning to kind of go. <laughs> Just quickly then, well, let me get another round of Well, I can't answer all these questions. I mean, that, that sometimes the term utopianism is useful to describe some elements of this rather than communism. Because there's a kind of impulse to make the world which is associated, associated with futurism, which I think is expressed in the work of St. Eliot, the conception of the new city. And I kind of don't find it in the ideas about clothing, which everybody's doing that, actually. Everybody's sort of like thinking about that, and like flying clothes. Right. <laughs> um, so uh, sometimes it's kind of categories, everything gets called futurism. Um, it's kind of like difficult. Um, on destruction, I mean, Le Corbusier also argues that the war made us better. So some of these guys, they're kind of just like the brutal, sort of unapologetic expression of capital, because that's kind of you know, the war did pull things up and sort of from, from the viewpoint of uh, the problems of society and from the viewpoint of the elite. <clears throat> um, so that kind of celebration of war, um, we're not that familiar with it because in Britain they all write poetry about the of it. But, but in terms of other European culture, it's not, it's, it's not unique. Um, and 
I don't know the answer to the question about the relationship between you know, Germany and fascism and Italy and fascism. I didn't, I didn't find the Griffin really, uh, I thought it was very interesting and that it raised some questions in my mind, but I don't think it answered it. I didn't realize I was too well, so I apologize to have a historic view of that issue. Um, but clearly there is some connection with the weakness of the state and the relationship to the working class that you'd have to negotiate all the non-existence of the working class as a force in that side. You'd have to work that through. But the interesting thing for me is that Italy isn't the place. I mean, Italy's peripheral, really. The place where this discussion really takes place is in Germany. So if, you know, if you'd said do a discussion on the avant-garde, I would hardly have mentioned the prison. They're like a bi, bi story, really. Um, except for that, because they're kind of childlike, it's the most extreme and adolescent expression of the most negative aspects of the avant-garde. That's what I would have to say. Germany is where it's really at, as far as I'm concerned, maybe Paris to a certain extent, but it is really true for the French that they are held back by the academy. The, you know, the structure and the historic weight of the old institutions kind of do pose a problem, I would say. The Beaux-Arts tradition poses a problem for the French, and it's, you know, somebody comes from Switzerland and revolutionizes. But in Germany, the state wants to revolutionize things. So, uh, and transforming the culture. So if you look at the Deutsche Werkbund, which is the forerunner of the Bauhaus, which is basically German business and German artists and German intellectuals getting together to say, how do we deal with mechanical reproduction and its impact on artistic output? And how do we make German competitive in terms of this industrial output? And there you see a kind of synthesis of politics and um, it's only for a moment, but you see a much more direct synthesis of politics and the interests uh, of the elite. So I think really Germany is the place if you wanted to, to look at this, this, this question. But I very, I'm sure somebody knows more about it and will have something very interesting to say about the historical continuity. In the discussion on architecture, Italy is always the place that the discussion about continuity takes place. Just to try to get people to understand um, the issue, this is an image. Mahoney and Nagy gets a bad right up a lot of these things. It's Hungarian. comes uh, to Berlin and uh, is very involved in, he did the light modulator that I showed, very involved in thinking about photography, painting, and film. This is, do people know this idea, the telephone paintings? Do people know the concept? Very briefly. Basically, he said, um, <coughs> I am going to, it's a bit like Duchamp's toilet. The Red Maid Fountain thing that happened around the second. He said, I'm going to make this painting by ringing a guy in the factory and giving him coordinates over the telephone. He is then going to plot those coordinates on the canvas and the outcome is this image. So that is the, the question of artistic production in the mechanical age, which Benjamin is also looking at. Like how, do you, how do you obtain the and centrality of the artist in a process where the artist is no longer at all present. To me that's a very interesting discussion and it relates to the question of meaning and beauty. I think the Germans would genuinely try to explore that. I don't think the teachers would just go, it's a good question, let's go do something else. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, two more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, mean, I think that's, that's kind of an interesting point actually because when you, I think when you compare the futures to the uh, constructivists in Russia or um, the Bauhaus and so on, the logical conclusion to them was the end of art really, it was dissolving art into um, design and architecture and the practical application of, of the discussion of art to uh, manufactured objects. And they couldn't really, they couldn't really carry on as, as artists because that was that was decadent and decoration, you know, was, was irrelevant to this new world. Whereas I think the thing with the futurists was that they did see their role as interpreting um, this this new world, and they they in that sense they put themselves at the centre of the process. Uh, Bocelli uh, designs, you know, he, he, he makes what's actually incredibly conventional, broader sculpture. As a way of interpreting speed, or um, you know, uh, Santoni's drawings—they're they're very traditional pieces of, of drawing, 
really expressing some, you know, aestheticizing industrial buildings, really. But they're working in quite a conventional form. They're, they're interpreting and trying to give expression to what's happening rather than just saying, okay, we're just going to do textiles and ceramics and practical, you know, apply our ideas to practical objects. And I think that's quite different. Um, I, I was just wanting to go back to the, the thing about the penguin ball. I mean, I know the Beckham was a bit, it was a futurist, but I mean, in a way, his, his work did directly relate to that. And makes, it also makes you think of work in Italy that, that directly came from the future, it's like the Lingotto Fiat factory, um, or designers like Joe Ponti, who were really exploiting the lightness of materials and furniture and so on. But with the penguin ball, that's interesting because the design of zoos, zoo architecture, is quite an interesting means to understand the way that architects have thought about their relationship to the natural world. Um, because you know, the way you design for animal environments is a very direct expression of that sort of idea of um, modern nature. And I, and I think that, um, uh, I, I'm not sure I agree with this sort of view that this was all just technology driven and it, it wasn't human centered. Or human beings who kind of written out of this equation because I saw it more that um, actually, you know, it, this, was, this was expressing man's kind of mastery over nature and the fact that you had the dependent all this absolute um, representation of beauty and of, of, of a man-made construction, this kind of cantilever concrete ramps which stand up without any apparent means of support, you know, this sort of wasn't making any criticism. <laughs> <No. laughs> it's just saying that you literally lifted the idea. Yeah. But, 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 you know, that, that nowadays, um, what we think of as a human-centered or as a, yeah, human-centered way of designing is, is to reject anything artificial or sort of technological, technological and to, to just sort of conflate human-centeredness with nature. So it always has to be now man as nature, um, so sort of, you know, vernacular huts rather than skyscrapers or anything, because they're not seen as human-centered. Our time management's not been good, but just one minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that sort of follows on from that, really, because I'm also just sort of uh, speaking in defense of anti humanism and this aesthetic um, uh, term, really, because it does occur to me that the um, pseudo humanistic face of the art and design of the Third Reich and the Soviet Union is highly problematic because here you have um, vast numbers of human representations which are confronting the viewer with. This is how you should be. This is uh, this is you, and it really sort of confines the, the, the person who is actually the real human being uh, in, in terms of to interact with that, which I think is an ongoing problem in design, uh, uh, particularly in software design. I think these days, which um, rather than being I think it's going to go here, an ergonomically honed empty space, um, you get sort of. Um, design which is sort of given to you and tells you how to use it. Um, you press the button, it does that, and actually it doesn't allow the real you, you know, humanity, humanism is really about humans, not about um, the spaces and artifacts with which with, with the interact. Uh, and that therefore, not so much anti-humanism really, but design particularly, um, it should aspire to to, to present us with something which does not reflect us, but allows us to do whatever we want to do with it.
society now is more important than the individual. But when you read Marinetti, you see the emptiness of that concept of the self. So, so at that moment in history, I would argue that there is definitely a problem with the kind of uh, exclusion of the human being uh, in favour of the mechanical and technical process. And strangely enough, when you read what they say about the total theatre, that is very definitely the case. And, 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 I, and I was really surprised because I thought the total theatre was all about the working class. And in fact, interestingly, there's something it tells you about fascism, the kind of the ritualisation and the aestheticisation of politics. I don't quite understand it, but um, you know that idea of propaganda, um, which you know the Soviets engaged in as well, that sort of idea of creating a myth and a spectacle to engage the imagination of the masses, is kind of the kernel that is there in some of the literature that's expressed by futurism. And then I think what Trotsky says in the literature, how that works itself out in terms of whether that's about humanism or whether that's about creating mythologies and creating propaganda in a sort of negative sense depends upon the relationship between those intellectuals, that middle class artistic producers and the revolutionary movement in the working class. So, I mean, that, that, so, so the fact that those people continue to see their role as revolutionaries in the realm of culture means that they are particularly susceptible at stage managing fascism. Them. So it's no, it's no, no accident, no accident that <laughs> directly, you know, begins progressive, becomes a reactionary, you know, dies probably a liberal, I don't, I don't know, but you know, it's, it's a good guy in the process. So for me, I think that that subject I, uh, uh, is actually, I think, that, I think Bruno talked about, I think it's really right, about this, and the guy who took that cyber one, when you look at the literature now, um, I think that cyborg thing and reappears in the post-war period. Um, again, the fetishization of technology and the, that to me is the beginning of the discussion about the mind as a biological and mechanical process, um, which is really interesting. So I think this man of the machine thing in futurism, it doesn't provide the intellectual basis because there's not much intellectual basis. It provides the kind of aesthetic form through which people then uh, discuss that in the perspective, and I think that's probably what futurism has done with most of all. It's a bit like Che Guevara, not really a revolutionary, which is why you see him used to brand every kind of product in the world. Because he kind of looks sort of radical and youthful, um, but if anybody can use it in any depth, it's really to be There's a great joke about Che Guevara becoming Minister of Finance, but I won't come to the time to tell you. <laughs> One point, I've had to restrain myself, um, but I'd like to leave you with a thought which I think might relate to this, is that in 1919, the 4th of May movement in China had the slogan to Mr. Silence and Mr. Democracy for modernity. Uh, in 2013 in China, uh, until recently, the majority of the Politburo were trained engineers, and the new president and the new prime minister both got doctorates in urban studies, having 100 cities, more than 100 cities with 1 million people, and 300 million people moving. So, let's stop China. <laughs>